is titled P2 Panda and um, it's about a festival organization pattern software system we'll hear about it uh, soon so festival organization is usually done by a small group and um, it can be decentralized and um, the three guys talking about uh, P2 Panda um, they did organized some festivals in the past and um, they're gonna probably talk about the festival Verantwortung 3000 which they organized and I think it's Hoffnung 3000 probably, I hope I spelled that right um, and uh, the platform is used to set up groups, festivals, gatherings art installations, stuff um, what you can think about it and they will present also some fictional ideas of festivals um, of the future and what I really, really like, they will talk and tell us everything about pandas. Please give a warm round of applause to Sophie, Andreas and Vincent. Have fun. Yeah, hello. The panda, the ingenuous being that wins your heart just by rolling around. Its qualities are known and appreciated. The panda is cozy, it is cuddly, it is fluffy. To talk about pandas means to talk about cuteness. It is kind and means no harm. It brings people together and won't let you down. The panda goes on adventures. The panda is cyber. Yeah, hello. Um, we are Sophie, Vincent and Andreas. I both sit here. Uh, we are the Peer to Panda gang. Um, Peer to Panda, that's a protocol for organizing um, festivals in a decentralized manner. Um, we're gonna tell you a little bit about it today um, and split up this whole um, lecture in three parts. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the backgrounds of Peer to Panda, its history. Um, then Sophie will lead over talking about the actual technical implementation of it. Uh, and Vincent will end this talk with and outside what future festivals you can do on Peer to Panda. Um, also one disclaimer, uh, everything we're gonna say is uh, the work of many, many people. Uh, we're just a part representing this group, uh, so we'll only cover a small detail of it. So yeah, let's start with the history. Um, to the left you see Laura, uh, to the right you see the panda. Um, Laura is part of a collective named Blatt 3000, um, which started as a magazine in two, uh, 2014 in Berlin uh, on experimental music. So we were interested in, imp interested in improvised music, um, contemporary music. Um, so far we published nine magazines, um, made two festivals, had many release parties and um, gave a few lectures. Um, Blatt 3000 consists of Laura, Malte, Sam and me. And um, the whole magazine we started was basically circling around two questions. The first one was, um, what happens if we don't curate at all? So what we just said, we'd publish anything people send to us. Uh, we named that uh, non-curation. Uh, the second thing was um, we encouraged people to um, ask questions and don't say too many answers. So we asked people to write fragments or impulses, we called them, um, to encourage people maybe to say something, I don't know, not so 100%, maybe a little bit stupid, um, not be so, so fixed in, in, in their position, but try something new and think about maybe things um, other people can then answer to in the following magazines. Um, so this sort of format um, started to be some sort of platform for fictional ideas. Um, uh, it helped us to start dreaming about, okay, what are ways we want to make music um, together? What are ways to organize ourselves? Um, what are ways to, um, what are nice ways to be together? Um, all with a background of music, you have to remember. Like we came from, come from a musical background. so. We were dreaming about like the festivals of the future we want to be part of, um, the sort of concerts we want to perform. Um, so yeah, from the, all this reflection on, on these future ideas, we also realized 
I mean, we, we, are, we are mostly from a German background, so Germans, they're known for being very critical and very like everything sucks attitude. Um, so we were the same. We were like, all these contemporary music festivals, they suck. Experimental music sucks. It's just conservative. It's full of guys. It's, um, it's, uh, it's very, very restricted in their curation, in their um, juries, in their funding structures. All of this sucks. But then we actually also realized um, yeah, we kind of started to not go to these concerts anymore and not uh, see this art anymore. But um, yeah, then we realized, OK, it's actually about the environment in which these things take place, not the art itself. The people are all right. Like the music is all right. It's mostly these environments. Um, so we started to think about, yeah, what are these environments? What are these frameworks? Like, what is this curatorial structure? What, what are the juries? What, are, what is this funding? Um, and how can we hack that? Um, so, yeah, there was lots of talking in these magazines that was also boring at one point. Uh, we wanted to also experiment with actually doing something. Um, from this point on, um, we started to plan a festival. The first one was named Verantwortung 3000. Um, it was like, um, it took place in Brandenburg on a small farm, or a quite large farm actually, uh, with 50 participants. Um, the idea was quite simple. We just said there are as many places you can uh, pick from um, the Toilettentrakt, the Gutshaus, Seminarzimmer, the Hof, the lake, um, many, many beautiful places. And um, people could bring their resources and just share them with each other to do whatever sort of events they wanted to do. This whole thing lasted six days and was a very interesting experience for us, which we then reflected upon in the upcoming Blood 3000 magazines. So then the magazine shifted from we publish everything to a little bit more like, okay, Let's learn uh, and and let's learn from what what happened and um, it it kind of raised many many questions for many people maybe from a, I mean there's a few hackers in this room they're probably used to like chaotic um, self organized systems um, for artists like in being in some sort of like commission loop for their whole lives that's quite new uh, so for many people it kind of shook uh, was shaking up the whole idea of how to make art actually. Um, so these magazines became some sort of platform to reflect upon that. And this inspired us to work on the next festival. And actually, for this time, um, under the name Hoffnung 3000, uh, we invited other collectives to kind of think together with us what would be the festival of the future for you. Um, yeah, so we, we were asking all these people, like different collectives from different backgrounds, and it took us almost a year to plan the next platform. Uh, we built this from scratch again, like another platform. Um, the festival took place in Berlin in 2017, this time with a smaller group, but in the middle of the city. So we had a headquarter. Um, and one other speciality of this festival was uh, any sort of GPS position was a potential venue. So the festival could take place in, in someone's apartment, in, in the park, uh, in professional venues, but also really anywhere. Like people started to join in from Tokyo, from Sardinia, from London. Um, anything which was a GPS position is a potential venue. I'm going to show you a little bit of the platform itself. Um, uh -huh, it's up there. OK. <laughs> I have to click like that, I guess. Uh, yeah, this is the platform. I give you a small demo of what you can do. I think that gets more clear what you can do on Hoffman 3000. Um, you basically always start with creating resources because this is what you're going to bring to the festival. Um, there's their markt to do that. So people just bring whatever they want to share with everyone else. Yeah, there's different things. It can be a skill, it can be an item, it can be something, um, I don't know, esoteric, something completely uh, virtual. Um, there's also somewhere there is a panda as well. Um, where is it? There it is, panda and aga aga. Um, you, can, you can then create a place. Um, give it a title, give it a description, upload some images, give it an address or the actual GPS position I was talking about. It doesn't work anymore. Also, we don't use Google anymore. Um, that's the old version. Um, or you can also define it as a virtual space, which was also quite interesting. Many people created virtual spaces. What does that mean? Like it's, it's, an, it's an event happening in your head. Um, 
yeah, there's some other things like slot sizes you could define when I'm not home um, and all of these things. And then other people could just create events. What's the title of the event? Description, image, where does it take place? Okay, cool. Uh, the Friedrich Ludwig Jahn Sportpark, we had a choir who made a concert there. Um, when is it? Uh, maybe here. And then what resources do you need? Uh, Marode Pandas. Um, a creative human I need. And our transcriber is, uh, I already selected, okay, yeah. Cool, you can also directly see what resources are occupied at this time, so you can't use them. Cool, and this is then actually everything you need to make a festival because then this event just pops up in the calendar and it's there uh, and people can just come. Um, this is what we've done for four days. There's some, some other fun features here. Um, one is uh, this activity stream, you see it's like anonymized animal avatars. So we were experimenting with the thing that you just don't know who you're working with. Uh, it's just a randomized animal avatar. Um, we had a GIF stream. The whole festival was documented in, in a series of millions of GIFs. Um, and there's also a random meeting feature. So if you feel bored, you can just click it and then it will put you together with random people in a random place at a random time. So this is, this is Hoffnung 3000. This was what we've done in 2017, but um, it's still being developed. You can run your own festivals with this, like the source code is available under this address. And also we made an, a, uh, an own page um, with tutorials on how to set it up and how to, um, yeah, how to, how to um, use it. And actually there's also in the next year, there's two festivals happening um, using Hoffnung 3000. Uh, the first one is the Molecule Festival in Cologne in May, uh, and the second one is the Femme Music, um, which is not an actual festival, but more a gathering of um, feminist activists. Uh, so if you're interested, you can just write uh, to their email. Um, through the, all of these festivals we've been doing, which were quite music focused, we realized um, that self-curation, decentralization, anonymization, and all of these things, they're not exclusively interesting for music festivals. Uh, it's more the other way around. There's like communities which have been working on this for many, 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 many years. Um, for example, the hacking community, the um, activist communities. So we started to realize, okay, this is, this is much more interesting than only making music festivals with this. Um, so we founded the Liebe Chaos Verein in Berlin this year, uh, where Sophie and Vincent is also part, from, uh, part of, um, and Blatt 3000 became the Vereins Magazine. Um, and the whole Verein is dedicated to these kind of meta questions. What are frameworks and how can we experiment with them? What does it mean? Uh, and let's just put them into reality and see what happens. Um, the next idea we're working on is then Pier to Panda. That's the, that's the current project of the Verein or one of the projects we're doing. And there's the, also the whole idea, let's bring it some steps even further and just say, let's, how can we make the whole festival hackable? How can this whole infrastructure be, be hacked like um, all the time? Um, so we decided to build a protocol on its own, a protocol to organize resources, events, um, and places. Um, we decided to build this whole thing on top of Scuttlebutt. Um, maybe you haven't heard about it. Some of you probably uh, did. It's a um, fantastic peer-to-peer -peer social uh, network protocol um, with a really beautiful community with very, very interesting and wonderful people. Um, you can go to their tea house in Comona. Um, and I just say a few things about Pieto Panda itself, just very roughly. We're going to hear much more soon. But basically what we're interested in in that protocol, which doesn't exist yet, but like we're about to start uh, developing it. Um, the first thing is it's, it's peer to peer, so it's, it's not running on any sort of centralized server infrastructure. Um, which is great because you just open your laptop, you start Pier to Panda and you have a festival, kind of. Um, and it comes very close to our whole idea of non-curation. Like we don't want anyone to decide what this festival is. So anyone can decide at any point, uh, let's open our 10 laptops and this is our festival. Um, the next thing is it's an open protocol. So this gives us very interesting like opportunities to just say, 
we just agree upon how we want to communicate, but not what and how the data is being displayed. Um, so this gives completely different ideas of what a festival can be. Is it a 3D festival happening in virtual space? Is it a festival for only bots? Um, we, we don't know, and we also don't want to know. Um, we, just, we just want people to give the opportunity to communicate with each other. And the next thing is, um, yeah, I mean, if you have a, a decentralized festival, what does it mean for in terms of temporality? Is it happening over the whole year, maybe? Maybe the festival never ends. Maybe it's just different sudden bursts, like um, occurring. Um, and this is maybe some sort of gathering, um, which you could name a festival, maybe. And the next thing is, um, we're going to learn about this soon. Uh, because of this cryptographic features, um, anyone is kind of able to interact with the system and your actions are, um, your role in the system is defined by your actions and not by the permissions which were given to you. So it doesn't matter if you're an administrator, visitor or participant. And now we're going to hear a little bit more how this actually works. So Sophie will tell you more. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Andreas. Um, the panda goes cyber and so like Andreas said I will now show you uh, uh, our still growing ideas of how we like to design and implement the protocol. Uh, we already started but there are still a lot of questions. So as said Peter Panda will be a collection of tools for users, bots and developers to set up such festivals Andreas talked about. And uh, as he also said, it should be uh, really uh, simple. So one of our goals really is that everyone can use it and it is really accessible and you don't have to be a developer to use it. Um, okay, first of all, why peer-to-peer -peer, uh, technology and, and also basically what is it? I'm sure a lot of people know the term, but um, yeah, it's always worth it to, uh, to remind yourself, I guess. Okay. Peer-to-peer -peer or person-to-person -person is essentially about non-hierarchical social relations. So um, in technical terms, it's an infrastructure. So everyone is equally privileged, there's no server, and it's offline first. So um, yeah, and it's offline first. And uh, what also was very important for us in our decision to use a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, that this is really independent of cloud providers. Um, and also peer-to-peer -peer is a, a relational dynamic through which people collaborate with one another to create value in the form of shared resources. Um, and uh, the offline first character means also that you can just start to create your content uh, without internet con connectivity. So these were really uh, basically uh, a lot of pros for us to choose this in the first place. Okay, let's dig a little deeper into the technical parts. Um, what's a person, peer or user in this context? It's basically a cryptographic key pair like uh, yeah, public and private key, I'm sure you know, um, which is generated when you open peer to panda uh, It's the identity of the user. And a user can be anyone, there's no dis distinction. There, uh, it can be a visitor or an administrator, it can, be, it can be a bot, it can be a person or a collective, it doesn't matter. Um, and this user shares creates and shares, shares events and resources. Um, how does the user do that? So we use the secure scuttlebutt stack, which provides append-only logs. Uh, that means that each user has a feed of messages that form this log. And everything is a message that cannot be modified once it is posted. So like here, create a resource is a message. Also, the messages reference to each other and you have, you have to imagine it like a chain that is forming. Everyone creates the messages on top of on the other message and on its own. And it's quite elegant to use an append-only log because it uses a conflict-free replicated data type. So this is useful in this peer-to-peer -peer context or for us, for our peer-to-panda protocol because it prevents merge conflicts of shared messages. 
So, and as you can see, every user does this or forms it feeds its log on its own. And the question is, um, now the users in the peer-to-peer -peer universe have to find and connect to each other. And they do this through discovery methods and replication of the messages through the Panda network. Um, to connect to others, user broadcasts their identity to advertise their presence, basically. And then they can replicate their logs, which, mean, which means they share their messages. And here an interesting effect um, comes from the offline first nature of peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, imagine that there's a peer-to-panda event going on, and depending on your setup or internet connectivity, uh, there are different views of this event possible. Uh, since some users might already have posted something, but only shared that in a small group via Bluetooth, for example, uh, but not with uh, users on other places, uh, if they're offline. So as you can see here, the yellow user um, has not all messages from the blue one, and the pink user doesn't have any messages from the yellow one at all. And to our mind, that could mean that there's not only one event going on, but maybe many parallel ones. And we think that this offers many possibilities for things to unfold. Okay, so now, yeah, the data types we use, and I already mentioned them, um, they consist basically of users, resources, and events. And at the moment, um, yeah, at the moment we, uh, we, we use these notions, but uh, we also think about other terms because sometimes they might be a bit limiting. Anyway, to remind you, a user shares and creates events and resources. A resource in our context can be really anything. It can be a guitar, it can be a location. And an event is really basically just a set of resources. Um, for example, a concert. So the pink event now uses the two yellow uh, resources. And peer to panda helps users coordinate the process of mapping available resources to the events that need them. And so as you can see here, the resources might be needed um, at more than one event at the same time. And at this moment, we think that a request authorization process can help. And to, uh, um, to illustrate that, i show you some UI um, examples we already um, thought of. So peer to panda first of all, could have a replication health state. Uh, to understand, so you can understand how well connected you are right now with others. Or it could also have a confirmation state of requested resources. And uh, this is to indicate how much the uh, event is progressed in its preparations. Um, if I want more resources for my event, I request it like so. And the other user can accept or reject by request. Mm. We think that we will initially implement the first come first served policy where the user authorizes requests of resources, how they come in, um, or the system does it in an automatic way. But there are also many other possibilities you can think of, uh, like you can let the system decide it randomly. And there are still also many, many other more possibilities uh, which you can do with Peter Panda. And now will Vincent tell you about those and the adventures and dreams and future dreams of Peter Panda. Hello. Yes, so Sophie told us about the implementation and if you are a technical person, you might now imagine what the software could look like. But if you look at these building blocks that Sophie described, clients, resources, 
and festivals. These could be really a lot of different things. And um, so I want to uh, give some examples, um, sometimes also referencing some of the memories that Andreas told you about in the beginning um, to yeah, open up these concepts and let you dream about what else these could be. So let's start with the clients. Um, a client, as you are probably imagining it right now, is um, something like an app or a website that you go to to look at the far plan, the schedule of events or to make your own event in the festival. But um, as the protocol offers just a data stream, a client could be a lot of other things. Um, a client can transform data to present or preserve it in alternative ways. For example, in this conference, we are lucky to be able to look at recordings and memories from past C3 conferences, but that is not the case for a lot of other events, and it would be nice to go back a couple of years later and look at what happened. This is actually one very strong argument, I think, for peer-to-peer it allows you to own your data again. Uh, so you have visited this event and now the data is on your computer. You can keep it, nobody can take it offline. Another example is that clients can also be part of the festival itself. You have all of this data available and you can use it creatively to create installations or other apps like the wonderful C3 nav app here and because we have a unified data model that offers these resources and users, um, all of these apps can reference each other and it would be more easy to make them uh, compatible with each other. And I think this is really one of the crucial ideas of what this is about. Um, if you think about what is the difference between something like C3, where we are, or an event like the Fusion Festival and other events where you have a small group of organizers that create something that is then consumed by a lot of other people. It's that these festivals or events opened up and allowed visitors, the people that come here, to transcend this passive role of just consuming and instead bring themselves into the event. And now you walk through these spaces here and you see all of the beautiful things that people have brought here. And what this does is it enables a sense of community. You're not just going to somebody else's place and looking at what they did, but you can bring yourself into it and make it part of yourself. So some other examples of clients. Um, Andreas al uh, already spoke about the random meeting idea. And in that case, it was part of the Hoffnung 3000 software. But if you have an open protocol, like peer to panda everybody can make something like a random meeting bot. Um, bots could also provide data that can be used by other bots. Um, by processing historical data or remixing data. And now, if you go from clients to what are the things that you do there? You, you request resources in order to make sessions, make events, make workshops. Um, in the end, Sophie, uh, shortly mentioned the possibility of, a, I, th I think you mentioned random authorization. So there could be lots of different authorization kinds. And these could enable for completely different uses also. So um, if you use this software as a group, you could have majority auth, where um, uh, access to resources is only granted when a majority of the group says, yes, this is okay. You could have random auth, you could have video auth, where um, 
you only get access to technical equipment once you have watched an um, instructional video or game auth. You need to crack the high score if you want to ride on my electric uh, box or something. <laughs> so lots of possibilities and ways to be creative with this without asking for permission because anybody can extend this. Now if you go to resources, um, what is a resource? It can be anything you bring to the venue and uh, we saw some great examples from what um, Andreas talked about. Uh, it could be cables, a teddy bear, a printer. It could also be access to a printer or a skill. Like if you're a mime performer, I could maybe um, request you to assist me in this presentation and um, illustrate what I'm talking about. Also, I heard that mimes are close friends of pandas. So lots of possibilities. Really interesting idea, money resource. So you could have something like a 50 euro resource and then you say, hey, I want to make this workshop, but I need some stuff. And then you use majority auth to let the group decide whether you can use this money to do this. It could be that you need to um, promote your event and you get access to the homepage and the top spot in order to make your event really visible. Or maybe this is a virtual festival and the resource is just a 3D coordinate in virtual space. So now these are the things that are happening within the event, within the festival. But what is a festival? What is this? It's just a gathering of people. And of course, this is like such a basic thing that is everywhere where humans are, we always gather. And I think we can be very creative with this if we use software to create new kinds of getting together. So for example, we could have squad conferences. You're going to some conference and um, you notice there's people that are interested in something and um, you want to get them together, but there's no space in the conference itself, use peer to panda to make your own squad conference. It could be a conference where you don't know what you're talking about before. Or it could be a permanent festival. Like if you have a hacker space or a finance house, you can use peer to panda to give access to the resources there to everyone without having a start and end. So, Peer to Panda is about providing decentralized infrastructure for self-organized events. And as you see now, we have tried to make this as flexible as possible in order to accommodate lots of different kinds of events. But also there are some qualities that we want to embed in the system. Andreas already hinted at this. There's things like radical authorization. There's no admins that are privileged from the beginning. Everybody starts out as a just a user, just a client in the system. It's offline first, so we don't bind ourselves to infrastructure and we also don't require being technically able to set up this infrastructure in order to start using peer to panda It's an open protocol, so it can be extended and Scuttlebutt, Secure Scuttlebutt also already exists. So there is already other software out there that is based on the same protocol. And this is creating an ecosystem and I think it can be just wonderful. And last but not least, um, computers have this rigid way where they are very precise and very ordered, but you cannot deny that in this order there's always a little bit uh, a spark of chaos. And yeah, we would like to use this spark to ignite a campfire for us to get cozy and tell stories to each other. Yes, and you can become Pietro Panda too. 
Um, we have a GitHub where we have started writing the specification and we will now start implementing. Also, if you're not a technical person, you can just get in touch with us. There's a chat also linked there. And if you want to use Peer to Panda, we would love to support you in setting it up. And we want to create a festival. And we want to invite all of you to work with us to make it happen in 2021. A festival using Peer to Panda organized by the Liebe Karls Verein. And we will have a call for collectives for all the people that want to contribute something as a group. We will have a call for bots if you're a hacker and you want to program something, build something and play around with a system. You're all invited. And what is this? I think this is the birth of the panda. Yeah, thank you very much. Get on stage. So, wow, this was uh, cool. Thank you. <laughs> we have questions. Uh, so if you have questions, please line up at the microphones here in the hall. And we have a question from the internet, please. Yes, uh, first question would be, with the ephemeral system, what's your take on deleting data? Deleting data. And deleting or leaking? Was so it leaking or deleting? Deleting. Uh, <laughs> Just again, please. <laughs> Löschen. Okay, deleting, Löschen. of course. So, um, first of all, um, if you download something now and it's on your computer, then it's hard for somebody else to delete it, and this will be the same case here. Uh, of course, it would be very impractical if there wasn't a way to unpublish a resource or cancel an event. Ah, but this we will have. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. The microphone one, please. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a very practical question. Um, so there's resources. It's great. I can have a book. I can have stuff and all that. But my experience from like having these kind of resources, sometimes uh, they they are not used in the way that is like well to these resources. How do you handle these kind of Things. I mean, you didn't talk about these kind of like, uh, I would say like the ugly details, because, uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I'm, I think this is something uh, like technology can't solve in a way. If you could write it in a description text, like how this resource should be treated, um, you can, of course, you could have some sort of authorization mechanism, which 
prepares the person uh, to use the resource in a nice way like maybe you make this person watch a film for 10 hours and then you can get your book your favorite book it's a really important book um, but I think most of all it's just um, the person-to-person -person, uh, interaction so at one point you will meet this person at the festival and went, will hand over the book um, I think that's just maybe even more crucial than the actual um, implementation then yeah be um, at the persons to handle it the normal way you get yourself an advocate and then you fight this through excuse me i, I think i didn't hear it acoustically <laughs> okay I, i was just being a little bit uh, overdoing it so so then you will do it the uh, traditional way you will get yourself an advocate and you will fight it through to get redemption for your book that was destroyed <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably so <laughs> microphone two please um, I think one of the first things that I was uh, thinking about was uh, how this technology could help uh, protests like in Chile and Hong Kong because I think this is like exactly what they need especially uh, when we're talking about decentralized and offline so my question was um, what's your ideas for having an offline infrastructure for Peer to Panda. Yeah, I think uh, this. Uh, I mean, these these thoughts they came up on on of also by other people on the way. Um, um, I think it's a quite. I mean, like we've seen it with uh, similar peer to peer software. People uh, went to jail uh, for the Barcelona protests. Um, so. It's a sensitive topic, I think, but um, and, and source code got deleted from GitHub. Um, but generally, um, I think we don't, so far, the Scuttlebutt protocol doesn't provide 100% um, like encryption, except often private messages. Um, so there is, like, there is like things which needed to be considered. I think the Scuttlebutt protocol also already has modules to uh, allow Tor um, onion routing. Um, so there's many things which could be interesting to be um, built into Peer to Panda as well. Um, and I think there could, can be ways to, um, to make this more secure and actually really, uh, really strong for these people. Uh, there's also um, people working right now on private groups in Scuttlebutt. So it's not only like, it's actually larger groups having very secure communication. Um, so yeah, there can be there can be ways to think about. Right now, we don't include that in our thinking, but um, yeah, it's not out. Definitely not. Uh, that that was not uh, really my question. I, I get that this is a big concern, mm -hmm. um, privacy and uh, security. But like uh, the infrastructure, how do uh, these devices communicate? Offline, I'm. I'm just. I don't, uh -huh, I have sorry, never heard sorry. anything about it. Uh, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, one way would be um, you could do it via Bluetooth um, when when it's very uh, in, in near fields uh, networking, um, and another way is to have like um, local area networks um, which which are not connected to the internet. Um, yeah. Okay. okay. Or mesh networks. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Microphone one, then, I think. Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for this talk. Um, I've heard about Peer to Panda before, of course, but uh, this is the first time I fully understood it. And uh, the first thing that struck me was very similar to what the previous question was, in a way. And uh, it's also like, what defines festival? It could be demonstration. It could be uh, like a bunch of people gathering around music or dancing or whatever, right? But a resource could also be like, hey, I want to contribute to uh, this section of the code. So in a sense, what I'm hearing is also that the infrastructure that you're building with Peer to Panda is something that could potentially be used to organize around anything, almost like a DAO. Okay, cool, that's awesome. <laughs> so <a> blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Zelf. Um, yeah, I want. I'm, I'm just thinking about something because I, I think that was your question answered. Because there's something else I would like to say about this. 
Uh, my question, I think, I was wondering if you guys have been thinking along those lines. Yeah. And also, like, I'd love to hear more on, like, what your thoughts are on that. So, like, um, one of the things that I've been hearing from people that I have talked to about this project is, like, okay, what is the problem that you're trying to solve, really? What is the focused problem? And I think this is a thinking that is very common in software engineering. And... Um, like, I think also that you were getting at this, but we think of this more like a playground than a solution for a problem. It's like thinking what other ways could there be to get together and what new things could we do? And of course, it's wonderful if this can be applied to things that are already out there. And I think it's maybe even more interesting to see what other things we could make. Okay, thanks. Microphone two, please. It was such a beautiful talk, and I'm deeply sorry that I have a maybe a little bit depressing question. How do you keep people who fundamentally don't share your values from using P2P? How do you keep a neo-Nazi group from using P2Panda for organizing a neo-Nazi music festival? Or is it a situation where it is a tool and it's just you can use the tool for good or for bad? I mean, that's a, that's a very uh, c a common question and problem in the peer-to-peer -peer space, um, uh, which is not answered. Um, I think for myself, I can just say, um, I don't know, like I have, I see Nazis on the street. Um, I see them probably on the internet as well. Um, you know, like the problem is, is, it's a real problem. I see it anywhere and it will definitely also happen in that space. And I don't think that any space like protects you from that really. Um, but um, one very practical answer is it's possible to block um, malicious peers or peers you just don't want to be um, replicating their data with. Um, so there, is, there can be some sort of social network uh, which trusts each other but also prevents like certain groups to to not be part of it um, by just blocking these peers um, this is how for example scuttlebutt is also doing it right now and i think kind of also the only way right now i know there's one person in the scuttlebutt gang doing research on that um, it's a it's a yeah the phd huh? and you when do you publish it yeah. in march yeah uh, what can we what can we read about it cblgh.org okay yeah. cblgh.org so that, that's really interesting research which has to be done but i think like blocking is one way and um um yeah and probably one way in the long term is to make use festivals uh, with peer to partner and change our society so that we have to don't have those problems in the future so any more questions M microphone one i see so perhaps uh, before or beyond the Nazi question, um, how can I say, um, I have always these provocative questions for anyone who is in tech. Uh, how can you imagine um, apps or whatever uh, that actually uh, foster live communication instead of uh, uh, bringing it down and replacing it through uh, digital communication? And that would be... Uh, in one sense, I mean, a, a constructive uh, critique that I would like to make uh, to you because uh, from the art, coming from the arts, um, although I'm very seduced by the idea of not curating, I'm very seduced, I'm even more seduced about bringing down authorship, I would say, but anyway, I would, I would, I'm very seduced. How can you, I mean, it, it's very, it's not very inclusive um, to have an app like that. I mean, it's uh, it's reserved to the people that can, Master it. it, it's a certain, it works well in Berlin, but, uh, well, so what would you say to that? <laughs> you. Um, yes, I think you are right that um, if you create a technological system, yes, you exclude people who might not like or might not be uh, comfortable using it. I think also if you're using a social way of interacting, could also exclude people who are not comfortable using that. Um, I think best thing would be to have both. And in this case, uh, what's for me very interesting is that this creates an affordance. Uh, like 
the resources that might be in here, uh, they might be out there now, but I don't know about that. And just by having it presented to me, I, I, I hope that it creates new ideas uh, or thinking outside of the box that wouldn't be there otherwise. And the best thing would be to have a mix of all kinds of interaction and, and uh, creation processes. Like especially if you do it in a physical space, there's always lots of talking to people and just doing things. And you don't need to do this with the software always. Okay. Mm. Good. We have uh, one more question from the internet. Signal Angel, before you get cold. <laughs> Thanks. Um, put a code on. Um, uh, I think the question is a little bit related. Um, how do you plan on tackling abuse and or trolls on the platform? Are there any concepts for that? Um, maybe nothing. I mean, wh what I said before about the, this, this uh, known problems. I mean, not in the Fediverse. That's another example. Like there's the same thing with Nazis having their own uh, instances. Um, Fraud, um, yeah, we are right now considering um, that you have to follow a person before you um, start replicating the data with them. Um, so there is not, there's like an opt-in into, into choosing if you trust someone, if you want to replicate the data with that person, with that peer. Um, so this is one barrier you have to maybe go through first. Um, did I forget something? Yeah, maybe. Okay, thanks. Microphone, please. So, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I think it's a really cool project. I was wondering if you uh, have a pla planned um, target user group and if you think about threats to them. Because, uh, yeah, we heard protest groups. We heard about protest groups and I was wondering, like, what is your idea of, um, let's say I work for the police and I make an event or a festival uh, to arrest people. And so I think it's a very great project, but uh, I was just wondering, like, what is your recommendation for usage or your ideas on where it shouldn't be used or should be used? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have a clear answer to that except of, and I think maybe, I hope it this came through in this talk, is like um, technology is not only technology, but also the people you are surrounding yourself with and how you communicate it. Um, so we, this is why we want to work with Scuttlebutt, for example, and not make a blockchain application. Uh, there's great people in that industry as well, but uh, there's also many, many people we don't like um, agree with. Um, and also, it's it's a completely different narrative surrounded by it, and maybe not voluntarily. Maybe these projects are great, but still the vibe is there. Scuttlebutt has a vibe which is just fantastic, and the police would usually not start looking there if I, because it's it's just like there's a strong community of great people and a great great energy and um, this is not done with technology this is just people and and, and communities and I think this also goes a little bit for our work with Blatt 3000 I mean you've seen it a little bit we come from an underground noise scene experimental music scene this is not like this is not the big festivals this is not uh, this is not pop, like uh, I don't know a big pop festival so so I think also like already this is like um, this is maybe even more important than the actual part of the software, and I think this is al always what we what we think about before we actually build it. So it's like um, yeah, like who are you identifying with? How do you communicate it? Um, uh, it's maybe different than if we would have started like a software project right from the beginning, would have communicated it just as a software project and then throw it on artists. That's that's a different story and I think this is maybe a little bit how you can steer it, but of course we don't have full control of that. Thanks. Great. Can I Go just add one yeah, more thing? Sure. Yeah, sure. And uh, I think also that in, in order to really control it, in order to really prevent this, we would have to embed mechanisms that we don't want to embed. Like we would have to have exactly the authoritarian mechanisms in order to be sure that this never happens. Yeah. Good. Microphone two, please. Hey, and thank you for this really interesting talk. I would like to shift the conversation back to the artistic perspective. Um, what I find fascinating in what you did is the way in which platform culture converges with platform art or platform-based art, which I think we're starting to see more and more now. And it seems to me like what you've done is taken this 
the construct of a festival, broken it down to its possible components in a modular kind of way, uh, and allowed people to kind of like ex extrapolate that and use it in their own way. Still, and this is not intended as a critique, it's a curiosity, would you say that because of the particular structure of your platform, you see repetitions in the types of festivals that people are creating? Because they're basically using similar modular units that you've sort of kind of made accessible. Have you standardized the concept of a festival and to what extent? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> uh, very good question, thank you. Um, I think this is a little bit, um, it's a very, I think that's something we are, t we are thinking about. Um, so far, our answer to that was build a new platform for every festival. Um, I mean, you've seen that all of these platforms were built from scratch for each festival. They have a completely different name, they have completely different settings. So it's, it doesn't become that thing of like, okay, there's Transmediale. We're going there every year, it's super boring and nothing changes. <laughs> um, uh, and it's just like, you know, maintained for 20 years. And, um, and, and you, you could have also just like, you know, start something new from scratch uh, all the time. This is a little bit our philosophy. We want to, you know, build new things all the time from scratch. Um, also to um, to not jump and fall into this thing of like structuring it too well. And um, also for the participants who maybe came to both festivals, it, they couldn't, they could relate to it a little bit in the sense of maybe you get used to the chaos. Um, that's maybe one aesthetic or characteristic of these sort of festivals. There's a certain chaos element some people don't like, and I understand them very well. It depends on your mood, maybe, and how you feel right now. Um, and I think, um, yeah, but I think this is this is very important questions. One has to, I think, once again, like uh, look at outside of the technology. How do you announce a festival? And what groups do you announce it? Um, um, this already shapes shapes the festival a lot. It's not so much the technology, and also I'm, I once again, or maybe actably the first time I'm saying it, um, the Liebe Chaos Verein, for example. I mean, right now there's three developers on stage. I'm I'm an artist as well, but a musician. But uh, we also have technical backgrounds. The rest of our association doesn't. Uh, I think if you would have put a person here on stage, which is um, which is not uh, us, then you would have heard a completely different talk. And um, this is the good thing. Like, I think this is the really nice thing. Like you, there's many people who actually come to the festivals and they don't use the platform once. Um, they just made, or what happened was someone booked a 24 hour slot in the basement and just made a noise festival outside of everything. Um, uh, so th these things can happen and, and they're great. Um, so people start like, yeah, finding their own paths within it or uh, ignore it completely. One more. One more thing, um, in addition to that, in the Liebe Chaos Verein, uh, which was kind of like an umbrella for these kinds of projects, uh, we also tried to uh, think of this by um, having a specific chaos officer. So this is a person in our Verein whose responsibility is to uh, watch our processes and when things become stable to just uh, Bring some chaos. Just <laughs> destroy something. <laughs> I, I think that's very important. Okay. Thank you. Microphone one, please. Hi. <clears throat> I have a very uh, practical question. Uh, we just started organizing MCH, which will be a hacker camp in the Netherlands in 2021 with about 4,000 hackers in empty grass field. You know what it's like. Uh, I'll be coordinating the musical program. Uh, preferably, we don't have mainstream bands, but also not too experimental that nobody shows up. Uh, so hopefully, we will have every subgenre uh, presented on the camp. So how can I use Peer to Panda to mobilize the musical taste of all the participants uh, without giving too much attention to one who shouts the loudest, but get all the subgenres uh, presented on stage? Uh, so could you? Uh, f for example, organize taste groups or moderate or have a Spotify list and people vote or please help me out with that. 
So um, I think that is quite difficult to do if you uh, also give control to everybody else, like you give up control in this sense. Um, I think what you can do is um, to create some kind of uh, expectation by saying this is the kind of music that we like. But after all, I think that you really have to give up control and see what happens. And it could be that it's, it's not exactly the thing you like, but it could also be really great. <laughs> yeah. The, the music people like in general. So that, that, that people might again? organize some peer to panda on certain musical genres or something like that. Mm. Well, would that be possible, practically? Yeah. Um, of course, I mean, Th this is a, a, a very open source thing to say, but you can hack it yourself. <laughs> we will. Uh, but yeah, um, this is an interesting thought. Like, how can we embed um, being able to set expectations as the person who first creates an event, or maybe even to give the possibility to the group to communicate expectations to everybody else? Like, what kind of mix of music would be nice? Interesting idea. Yeah. So does it have a voting system? Or? Um, you mean a voting system to do what? Like yeah, you get a big list of bands and people can just vote. You know, popularity ah, choices. I mean, this could be something like you could have uh, a band that is requesting access to the main stage at the prime time and then what kind of authorization mechanism do you use for this? You could have mm. a, an authorization mechanism that gives everybody who attends the festival the option to uh, weigh in on this question and say, yeah, well, I don't really want to see them. Mm. And if there's a majority, then they go. Okay, well, that sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So thank you very much again uh, for your talk. Uh, round of applause, please, again.